A few have been sent over from the Thank you. 
Word of the day is hypotension. And we have a quick video that Len can set up here. Hey, he's buzzing. Yeah, who's been there? Yeah, it's amazing. I, I was in South America for the last two weeks, and this is sideways. I don't know why it's sideways, but that's because it's in South America. Everybody's sideways or upside down. Wasn't James Bond there? This is a, the most amazing natural wonder I've ever seen, so I just thought I'd show you like 20 seconds of it. It makes Niagara Falls look like a drip in your sink. There are like 265 different cascades that go over about a three-mile uh, area that's the border between Argentina and Brazil, about 300 miles in from the Atlantic coast. So this should be on your bucket list of something to do really quite an amazing place. Uh, the only other thing I was going to tell you is when we get a good broadcast, it, this works fantastically. I watched uh, Paul's presentation from Brazil and the uh, broadcast was perfect. I could see it and hear it uh, extremely well. Uh, so today we've got three different uh, presentations, so each hopefully will keep it to about 20 minutes. Um, We'll start, I thought we would start with Lisa, but she must Lisa's be... Lisa's trying to find parking. Sure. So maybe we'll start with uh, with David. You want to start first? Uh, I looked at his slides and this is going to be intense. Uh, it's easy for him, but not for me anyway. So it's an update on primary immune deficiency disease, which gets harder every day. Yes, it is. I think it is. Uh, so... If you read several uh, through the literature, so most of the people describe uh, Adam Adubelin as the first uh, primary, or at least genetic, uh, primary deficiency, and this is from Bruton's papers in 1952. They were first describing uh, an eight-year-old uh, child who started suffering from recurrent sepsis, mostly with pneumococci, at the age of four, and this is every episode of um, fever with positive blood culture. Um, that is uh, seromonetophoresis. Uh, this is a normal patient with the, the gamma, um, with the gamma component. He basically didn't have any gamma globulins. And later, when they were able to treat him with immunoglobulins, then um, he had some uh, gamma globulins. And you can see that the last episode of sepsis uh, was before they started gamma globulins. Um, so is there a simple way to approach PIDDs? Probably not. And when People are describing the field of uh, primary immune deficiency. They're using terms as explosive growth, exponential growth, etc. And this is probably due to, due to several factors. One of them, we have new methods to study um, immune, uh, immune cells so we can stain them uh, for different proteins, both surface proteins and also cytoplasmic and nuclear proteins. Obviously, next generation sequencing is um, um, something that um, led to major uh, breakthrough in the fields with um, almost new disease discovered every couple of months. Um, we have new functional assays to study signaling pathway, and there was also a change in concept. And the change in concept, and this is kind of cheating to enlarge the field of PIDD, it's not, we're not using PIDD only to describe genetic diseases with uh, little infection, but now we also include uh, autoimmune diseases, immune dysregulation, allergic diseases, auto-inflammatory, so no wonder we have more diseases. And there is another change. Uh, we're not talking about one gene which causes multiple infections like most of the diseases involving um, the adaptive immune system. We also talk about, we're also speaking about one gene which causes one infection. So if people are studying one um, 
unique disease, they might find a specific gene that will cause this, uh, this specific disease. Um, the last time I checked, and that was several weeks ago, I counted 239 monogenic uh, diseases. Um, I read about one each and every night, and within a year I'll be able to know all of them. Uh, I'm not. Um, so the IUIS is the International Union of Immunological Societies, and they are publishing a classification of the different um, PIDDs every other year or every two years, and this provides a brief description of the clinical immunological features, genetic defect, and type of inheritance. The most recent update was just uh, submitted, um, and, that's, and they divide PIDDs into nine categories. And this is the paper of the most um, recent uh, classification. This is from um, 2011. So what are the IUIS categories? The first is combined immunodeficiencies, either SCID or less severe combined immunodeficiency. The second is combined immunodeficiencies with associated syndromic features, which means that the patient can uh, be first seen due to specific abnormalities even before they, uh, they are presenting with recurrent infections, such in, as in the case of DeGeorge with hypocalcemia or with Cotasric syndrome, prone cytopenia. The third is predominantly antibody deficiencies, either um, agamaglobulinemia, CVID, or abnormal class rich recombination, uh, disease of immune dysregulation, and this includes uh, HLH, ALP syndrome, and t dysfunction due to different uh, mutation, either IPEX, CD25, STAT5B, IL-10, and most recently, STAT1 gain of function. And the congenital defect of phagocyte number, function or both, so that will inclu include congenital neutropenias, um, LAD1 to 3, CGD, and also MSMD, which is kind of interesting because it might belong to the next uh, category, which um, is defect involving innate immunity. And here is where the one gene, one infection um, approach or theory actually uh, was so shown. The first, I think, the first was actually with the uh, with IRAC4 and MyD88, um, patient with recurrent pneumococcal infection, so it was supposed to be Mendelian susceptibility to pneumococcal infections. And later on, there were other genes involved in herpes simplex encephalitis, mostly TLR3 signaling. EV with ever one, ever one, ever two, and WIMP, um, and you can also look at, at chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis as um, one gene, one infection, especially with the, when it involves IL-17 uh, secretion. Autoinflammatory disorders, complement disorders, um, are the next categories, and this is a new category which was not was not presented in the previous update, uh, and it's called phenocopies of PIDDs, which means that you don't have actually a genetic uh, defect, but you have something that mimics the genetic defects, like anti-IL-17 antibodies. And this is how the paper looks like. So you get the tables, nine tables, each describing different diseases, some immunological features like T cell number, B cell number, cell IgG, etc. And it's very easy to understand and follow the chart. <laughs> so does it help? Just nine of those. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and this is only part of the first tape. So yes. So does it help? I'm sure, sure it helps, especially when you know what your patient already has. Uh, so they try to publish a different uh, approach to look at it. And this is the paper called the phenotypic approach for IUIS PID classification. And it's supposed to provide the user-friendly classification of PID, providing a three-based decision-making process based on the observation of clinical and biological phenotypes. And this is what it looks like. So, for example, for table three, predominantly antibody deficiency, sure, you have to suspect it first and think whether or not the patient has um, immune deficiency, and you can start by checking uh, antibody levels, and, and then it can lead you through the different options, which antibody is deficient, and what other phenotype there or features that the patient have until you go and until you reach a diagnosis, or at least you know which test to send. This is another example with complement deficiency. Complement deficiency, sure, again, you have to suspect it first, and then does the patient have infection? Yes or no? Um, what kind of infection? Does he have other features? And then it can lead to treat, or at least, again, um, guide you to which test uh, you, should, you should send. Um, it's not very easy, but it might offer uh, some help. Um, so what's new? The last IUIS classification was published in 2011. Um, the last review of focusing on new PIDDs was published in February 2013, and this is the link, and they were describing 19 new diseases since, the, since 2011. So what was discovered since? Several weeks ago, I was reviewing the literature, uh, looking for new diseases, 
Um, I started at the day that the last paper was submitted until uh, three weeks ago, and these are the new diseases. Uh, card 11 uh, deficiency, which leads to agamaglobulinemia, so that's another agamaglobulinemia gene. Um, dominant negative E47 mutation and agamaglobulinemia. This is a very interesting um, new genetic diseases because most of the time when people are speaking about agamaglobulinemia, they are describing uh, defects which are associated with very early BCR signaling. And this uh, mutation has nothing to do with BCR signaling. So it's kind of, it's a transcription factor which uh, probably um, provide some uh, checkpoint for the development of abnormal B cells. And this patient has basically no B cells, but the few B cells that they do have are CD19 positive, high, and they are BCR negative. So they assume that the, um, this transcription factor prevents the development of BCR negative B cells. IL-21 receptor deficiency leading to susceptibility to cryptosporidium, cryptosporidium infection, and it is very common. It was described in two families so far. Um, and it makes you wonder, I mean, when you read about cryptosporidium infection, it makes me think about CD4 ligand disease um, or hyper-IgM, and it makes me wonder whether the CD4 ligand deficiency prevents from IL-21 expression, and somebody, somebody wants to study that. Yes, it could be interesting. Deficiency of PKC, uh, PRK, uh, PRKC delta, B-cell deficiency and severe autoimmunity, and other CVID um, um, genetic defect. Uh, another CVID uh, defect is the non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway, NF-kappa B2. Uh, and mutation in NF-kappa B2 um, presented as CVID, autoimmunity, and adrenal insufficiency, so that was a unique phenotype. Uh, mutation in VPS 45 that was published earlier this year, or late in 2013 at the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, actually, another case was presented earlier um, in Blood Journal, and both of them came from Israel, and have some stories behind the thing, but keep that for later. Uh, statue deficiency uh, caused severe viral infections, and activated PI3K Delta syndrome, aka APDS, PASLIS disease, um, which leads to respiratory infections, lymphadenopathy infection caused by herpes group viruses, variable antibody deficiency with abnormal and uh, B and T cell phenotyping. So it seems like every year there is a new disease that everybody's speaking about. In 2012, it was GATA2. In 2013, it was STAT1 gain of function. In 2014, who knows? But I think that this disease, the activated PI3K Delta syndrome, APDS, or with the shorter, shorter name, uh, PASLI disease, which stands for P110 delta activating mutation causing senescent T cells, lymphadenopathy, and immunodeficiency. And they were both described um, one after the other. The first one was published in Science in November 2013, and the second one was published two months later, uh, Nature Immunology, January 2014. So, what is uh, this disease? Um, what is PI3K? Um, it's a family of enzymes involved in cellular functions, um, cell growth, proliferation, differentiation, motility, survival, basically everything, and also involved in cancer. Um, it's an intracellular signal transducer um, which phosphorylate uh, PIP2 uh, into PIP3. Um, and just to make things easy, there are three classes of PI3Ks, each composed of several different heterodimers. Um, PI, uh, the P100 is part of the class 1 PI3KS, which is composed of heterodimers between um, the catalytic subunit P110, there are three of them, and P85, which is a regulatory subunit, five of them, and P110 delta is expressed primarily in leukocytes. So what does it do? Um, this is P110, and this is P85, the regulatory subunit. It attached to some um, membrane uh, receptor which has a phosphorylated uh, tyrosine. This leads to the release of the regulatory subunit, the P85, and P110 is free to perform is, uh, whatever it's supposed to do. So it phosphorylates uh, phosphatidylinositol P2 into phosphatidylinositol P3, so PIP3. And PIP3 is a very important second manager, uh, messenger which um, leads to phosphorylation of different uh, proteins including AKT, which is uh, central for uh, signaling in leukocytes, 
Uh, this is in B cells, so you can see that CD19 can lead to PA3K uh, activation. The same works for uh, the BCR, IL4 receptor, CD40, PLR4, G protein. Different thing can lead to activation of PA3K, which then phosphorylate uh, PIP3 and leads to activation of different downstream uh, signaling pathway and molecules. Okay. Could you repeat that? <laughs> Okay. Can you go on? Can you repeat all of it? The most, the most important, the important I thing. I was joking. Okay. So, but, but the most important thing is the PIP3, and PIP3 is is a very important second messenger, um, and it's kind of uh, um, it's downstream to many initial signaling pathways. Sorry, I didn't get the joke. I apologize. <laughs> I will see. Okay. Same with uh, T cells. Again, TCR signaling uh, can lead to PI3K activation. And again, AKT phosphorylation and downstream signaling leading to differentiation of ptosis cell cycle and growth. The science paper, which was describing the APDS disease, um, um, I think I found it interesting because they started with the random screening of different uh, patients. So they started with 35 PADD patients from the UK with family history of susceptibility to infection, general susceptibility. They, in the first round, they found three patients from one family and one patient from another family, which makes it four out of 35, more than 10%. The mutation was encoding an amino acid substitution, glutamic acid to zinc at position uh, 1021, so this is E1021 to K. And they, that was confirmed with Sanger sequencing, which also, at the same time, they found um, four, four more patients or family members with the same mutation. The mutation was not found in healthy patients, and they tested quite a lot of them. Um, they, then, they, then, they then proceeded with the second group of 134 uh, PADD patients from the UK. And again, they found five patients from three unrelated families. One of these family, one of these patients was previously diagnosed with hyper IgM uh, syndrome, and it was CD40 ligand positive, so it was hyper IgM of an etiology. So they screened 15 other um, hyper IgM patients from 30 fam families, and again, three patients from two unrelated families at the exact same mutation. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Were they screening in the exome sequencing? They screening for a single mutation or actually a range of mutations? First, they screened. They performed whole gen genome sequencing. They started with the common variant. And then uh, after that was ruled out, they found that was kind of a lie because they found the exact same mutation in, in two families. So that's the power of performing all exome sequencing on several families. When you have a cohort of patients with similar fe uh, features, then you're more likely to find a mutation. It makes it much easier. And in a smaller cohort, you wonder if there's maybe another kind of mutation. So uh, in the smaller yeah. cohort, they just checked for the, they performed Sanger sequencing only on this specific mutation already. They didn't perform whole exome sequencing. So once they identified the mutation, they screened only for the exact mutation. Uh, so out of the 15 hyper IgM patients, they found another three patients from two unrelated families, and these are uh, the family trees of the different uh, uh, patients. And I think that this is uh, probably more interesting because you can see that there is significant family history in most of them, but this is a de novo mutation, and they made sure that the parents are the real parents of the, uh, of the child. Uh, in the Nature Immunology paper, um, that was a more targeted uh, screening of seven unrelated families. Um, they were of different ethnic and racial background, which means that there is no founder effect, and all had a uh, history of childhood onset pseudopulmonary infection, lymphoproliferation, EBV, CRV, viremia, and nodular lymphoid hyperplasia, hyperplasia of mucosal surfaces. Several patients also had autoimmune cytopenias, and I think that they will fall under the category of what we described today as CVAT+. 14 patients um, in these seven families were found to have mutation in the same gene, but they found two other mutations. Um, six had the same 10 to 21, 10 to 21 mutation, but uh, two other mutations were described as well. These are the family trees, and again, two, the novel mutation here and here. And they're focusing on different clinical and immunological phenotypes. So this is the sign paper, which was describing uh, recurrent uh, respiratory, uh, upper respiratory infection, but also was focusing on CT evidence of large bronchiectasis or small airway disease, so mostly anatomical problems in the airway disease. And they mostly found reduced T-cell numbers and reduced B-cell numbers. Uh, the nature of immunology uh, paper was focusing on different things, other things, the EBV viremia, sinopulmonary bacterial infection, but also the lymphadenopathy and mucosal lymphoid aggregates. Um, another phenotype that they were focusing on is the presence of highly mature CD8 T cells. These are CD57 positive. 
And this is how uh, the lymphoid apoplysia looks like. This is in the mucosal, uh, the airways, and this is in the gut. Um, I'll skip all the flow chart unless somebody wants that, and we can go over that later. Um, but the interesting thing about uh, these two papers that both offered some kind of treatment, because AKT uh, was downstream to, to the PI3 phosphorylation, and AKT leads to mTOR activation. Rapamycin is a great target. Um, and uh, the Nature Immunology paper actually treated one patient with papamycin for a year, and after four months, they show reverse of um, the flow uh, abnormalities and also some reduction in lymph node size and the general, uh, the general picture of the patient. Uh, the other uh, science paper suggests another um, treatment. There is a specific inhibitor of P110 delta. It's called uh, idelalicib, GS1110. Um, O1, which was recently approved for uh, CLL, I think. Um, so they suggest that this could be another another treatment. Uh, this flow shows the normalization of the flow after rapamycin treatment, um, and that's what I wanted to show you today. So thank you very much. Wow. Yes. Wow. Uh, just have a quick question for you. We, you know, every time we hear a talk on PID, the hot topic is monogenetic causes and stuff. And obviously, we've learned a ton. I don't mean to take away from that at all. But the number of patients we explain through that sort of approach is very few. Mm -hmm. Because by far, the vast majority are CDID, selective antibody deficiency, and so forth. And I understand that the technology allows us to do this. But shouldn't there be more focus on developing better functional studies, uh, better way of characterizing patients You know, in terms of, of uh, because we're not going to explain most PID patients through monogenetic causes complex, mm -hmm. yeah. multiple genes, it's going to be thematic mutations, it's going to be all sorts of other things. So why is everybody focused simply on finding a gene for every phenotype rather than... I think everybody wants to find a gene. Well, oh, yeah, because you, you get, your, you get a, a good... And, and I think that it might be easier to study uh, some specific features. So if you, if you have a patient with a uh, unique presentation of one specific uh, infection which is recurrent and you get the same infection every time, and maybe if it has another phenotype, like somatic phenotype of the adrenal insufficiency of nf kappa b 2 then you're more likely to find a mutation. So people are trying to study that. I, yeah, they should find a way to study um, polygenetic diseases. Well, and, and with all the whole exome sequencing that's being done, find these, you know, all of those papers at best, they have like a 50% hit rate. In terms even of before, even few, yeah. Usually far less. Mm -hmm. um, and you think in having all of that sequencing data with the right sort of, you know, statistical analysis and stuff, you can start looking for gene-gene interactions and all sorts of things like that, and I, think, I don't see a lot of publication. I think it will come because every, today in many studies, every time you sequence a genome, you also load it to the NIH site, so yeah. there, with time you'll get more uh, sequenced uh, genome, then, and you can find a new association, so you just need to ask the question. I don't know if you'll have a little data available, but you ask the right question. Hopefully, we, um, probably yeah. a lot of that shared data becomes a bit of a waste. Yes, again. and I agree with the functional studies, this is the phospho-AKT, and I'm, I started uh, staining cell for phospho-AKT, I'm looking to find, to find the first um, PI3K delta patient. I hate to cut this discussion off, I only have two comments. Uh, one, good luck to those of you who have to take your boards. <laughs> <laughs> and the second is I wanted us to start with the easy subject, Art will go next, and uh, we'll talk about something a little more intense his uh, experience with brush immunotherapy. David, there's just an article in The Lancet about cost accountability and research. <laughs> and basically I'm suggesting this exact issue. So we're going to say one Thank you. I have easily enough material for 45 minutes. I'm going to try to rush through this fast. Thank Len for fitting me in. But I think this is ready for people who want to do it. It's been around long enough and I had, had enough experience I wanted to share share it. Um, to, I've given an abstract of something we, I put out at, at one of the meetings or poster presentation about in 2008 that describes the protocol I use. So for reference, uh, my disclosures, I, I'm on everybody's speakers bureau for HAE and also on TEBA. Uh, allergy desensitization is valuable therapeutic treatment and the need for a weekly injection <coughs> injections causes a lot of people to drop 
drop out and a lot of people did not do it. So when this started coming out, I, I saw the potential in it. Time is money. Uh, allergy desensitization is becoming more and more expensive, even though they pay less and less. Um, this Portnoy Sharkey's paper in uh, 1996 resurrected it. He, it was his contention that with heavy pre-med, prednisone 30 milligrams of BID, H1H2 blockers, that she can have acceptable safety. He claimed the safety was on par with the regular immunotherapy. I think he lied, uh, at least with this protocol. Uh, had one mild anaphylaxis and some, some resp mild respiratory things. Uh, it's become common enough that it's, it's listed in the task force report to talk about it. It's not considered experimental. It's even in the, in the, in the information handout from the college. So it's not, it's not considered experimental. Uh, comparing studies on this is really a headache. People use different, different schedules, different doses, different abstracts that have various different top strengths. People who have low reaction rates will 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 go to the uh, just to the one dilution below their maintenance. Uh, it's it's, tri it's really a headache. Uh, systemic reactions of a, a review paper by Cox. She claimed 27 to 100 percent. When I looked at all, everything she quoted, I think it typo and was more like 2.7 to 100 uh, percent. Those with animal dander at high doses, virtually all of them had systemic reactions of one form or another. So, so basically, you can't. It's really hard to compare studies. What this is what I don't want to see. Uh, this is a patient I had 20 years ago. Uh, a patient is getting allergy shots for my prescribed through my office uh, and was administered by a local pediatrician's office. A kid who got short of breath, acutely, epi, albuterol had to be resuscitated. This is a thing I absolutely did not want to see with any of this, and this is unacceptable. So when, I, I, when you see the medications I use to, for prevention and, treat, and treatment of reactions, you think, gee, this is excessive. What's he doing all that beer? This was in the course of rush. Or no, no. This was this was uh, an example of what I don't want to see. And this this is what we're all afraid of. I've seen about uh, rapidly progressive heart control anaphylaxis <laughs> maybe four or five in my career, uh, not in rush. Thank God. Uh, so this is what we're afraid of. Um, in my this is since 1996, I've done 363 which is a reasonably large experience. Uh, nine aspirin, 12 hymenoptera. I had a lot of flushing reactions and they were all mild. Uh, I added, uh, when I went out on this, I thought I could do it safer than Portnoy did. It seemed the rationale for leukotriene blockade. Normal doses t um, tend to uh, just shift the dose response curve, so I didn't trust normal doses. Leukotrienes, smooth muscle constriction, hypotension, constriction of coronary arteries, everything you don't want to see in anaphylaxis, it seems to be able to do. So it makes sense to, to aggressively block it. Um, at the time, it's no papers. Controlled studies on, uh, on anaphylaxis are really lacking. We don't even have a double-blinded control study on epinephrine for anaphylaxis. So, so this is an animal study where antihistamine pr pyrilamine saved uh, about 22% of the of the guinea pigs who died from anaphylaxis. The Merck 86 compound, a 5-LO inhibitor, saved about 40% of them. Both at normal doses, 25% of the animals. At high doses of antihistamine in the Merck, at the Merck product, uh, none of the animals died. Uh, I the way the patients were chosen, I I laid I laid it out as an option. I didn't offer it. They, they told me they wanted to do it. I want to make sure that, that uh, something goes wrong. It was their choice. Uh, if you pardon the expression, I'm, I'm being, I'm being uh, sardonic. That's not the right word, ironic, something like that. All patients uh, are written consent, absolutely. The pre-medicine, uh, I did 20 milligrams BID for four days before. I did initially started with Xyluton. 
and gave him extra Monte Lucas, 20 milligrams in the morning. When Xylutone went off the market, I just thought, what the heck do I do now? And Monte Lucas at high doses has some 5-LO, 5-LO properties. So I, so I went for, for 20 milligrams BID. And it's worked just as well. And it was, I didn't have to fight the insurance companies. I've continued it. Antihistamine, non-sedate, double dose H2 blocker. In addition, in the morning, I gave two extra doses of Montelukast. It may seem excessive, and it probably is, but I was wanting to get the 5-LO blockade. Uh, my office is a building that's still a hospital and it's still a 911 system. I measured that the FED1, FEC oximetry, vital signs uh, before every dose. I monitored them closely. It's pretty anal about making sure I could catch it early here, if you will. Uh, I, I went for the expected tolerated dose and I tend to be, treat people really aggressively with immunotherapy. So uh, I, I got a good number of reactions. Uh, when they have flushing reactions, reactions, what could you give them? Extra antihistamine, uh, five, uh, four milligrams albuterol. Initially, I gave full dose epi, but the flushing reactions were so mild that inhalational ep epinephrine took care of it. And I've been using low dose epi 0.15, and the, and it's been work it's been working well without too many side effects. Uh, I had 300 so far 363 uh, rushes, 341 to multiple air allergens, uh, 78 of the of the air allergen desensitizations were, were the patient had only one time for one day, so I had to either do the first day or or this, or get them up to maintenance depending on how high they were. Uh, four out of 13 hymenopter patients had flushing reactions. One patient has had wheezing. This when I first started, I used double dose acolyte instead of the, my normal, what I do now. And, and it's sort of what's the thing that drove me away from the normal dosage. Um, right, what, are you, what are you calling rush? I mean, how is your goal to get the maintenance in one day? Or my, your actual uh, protocol? It, it's, my protocol is, I'm sorry, put this together. It's in, it's in the handout, but handouts, but it's in two days. Uh, and some of, some of them had time for only one day where I did half of it or, or put them as high as I could depending where they were at. So like for conventional inhaling immunotherapy, you're advancing doses every hour? Yes. Um, I'm trying to go fast. That's all right. You answered. Yeah. Uh, every 45 minutes in the dilute, dilute times, uh, intervals, and, and at 60 minutes apart for the maintenance, in the maintenance file. And at the end of the day, I uh, watched them for two hours after the last injection at the end of the day. These people were in the office the entire day? Pretty much. And monitored very closely. Um, thank you. I'm sorry it wasn't clear. Uh, 121 of those who had multiple air allergens had flushing reactions. Some had mild urticaria itching. Eight of these were delayed. All of them were mild and reacted easily to treatment. Uh, give them a half dose epinephrine and they were better in 10 minutes. It, uh, and remarkably, they didn't progress, thank God. Uh, 21 had mild chest tightness or dyspnea, which is, when I went through the data, my data, I, was, I didn't think it was that many, 6.1%, but they responded to treatment. FEV1 had minimal, minimal to no changes. Eight of these 121, Eight of the 341 had some flushing reactions. I'm sorry, throat fullness. They were very mild, responded readily to treatment. A few of them actually, the liquid liquid and acid made, made it go away. So I thought, I think a lot of these were globus. There was one of my most worrisome ones was one who was two hours after they got home. Uh, she felt throat fullness. She was an obese lady. She gave herself that and swelling came and went. The 911 people came, saw nothing and left her at home. So I. There's nothing else except the sensation, so I think it was, I think it was globus. Uh, I didn't mention there were some people who felt sick to their stomach for a few days. One, one lady had repeated nausea and vomiting for a few hours, and uh, I stopped using the inhaled epi because it seemed to be 
doing that. And her serum tryptase level was four. It was low normal, which got me interested in tryptases, which I'll talk about. Uh, 190, uh, how am I doing for time? You got another five minutes. Okay, so I'm going faster than I thought it would. 195 patients, uh, when I, I was trying to find out more what these tryptases were doing when I tested this lady, and she had a low normal tryptase with the nausea. And uh, I did a tryptase at the beginning of the day, day one, and, two, and I drew the tryptase two hours after the last injection. And after, after the 80, last 83 of them, I sent to Dr. Larry Schwartz at Virginia for his for his, uh, for his more specific assays, the mature tryptase. Uh, let me talk about mature tryptase. Uh, we sort of think of tryptase as, as baseline and inducible, inducible being, being very specific for bad anaphylaxis. Uh, Dr. Schwartz calls that mature tryptase. Uh, and, and none of my patients had mature ele any elevated tryptase. None of the flushing reactions, nobody think. Uh, uh, so of the 195 patients I've tested, there was one elevated trip, regular tryptase that was in the er, early on, and he had he had flushing. His tryptase level is 20, and he rose from baseline of 10 to 20. Uh, of all the patients, that's the only one I had. Uh, interestingly enough, those who have flushing reactions, some of, a lot of them will have tryptases that will rise but stay in the normal range. So, so when you use measure tryptase to see if there's anaphylaxis. Probably the, the best assay is, is check them at baseline uh, and check them when they have the reaction because that is the most sensitive approach. Uh, and uh, I, I'd love to present that data. I, when it came out, I was really fascinated by it. Um, so in conclusion, rapid desensitization can be done with reasonable safety. Uh, it's, it's hard to compare studies with my with my, uh, I push my patients up higher than they probably should, and can, and I have a reasonable number of reactions. None of them will persevere. Considering the lack of severe reactions, the protocol I used was, was reasonably safe and effective. Uh, no, nothing severe, no hypotension, no severe obstruction. Uh, so is it ready for prime time? If you feel up to it, and you feel feel game. I think it is. I have the I have the code. I've, interesting enough, they pay a lot better than they do for regular allergy shots. Uh, I've been living into my billing office, and I only had one problem early on in 1996. And since then, they've been paying it like an in, inpatient pr inpatient procedure. I initially tried to make this the same cost per injection as the regular immunotherapy, but insurance companies and Medicare has cut back on the reimbursement for regular immunotherapy so much that that such it does cost more. But they've been they I know paying. Almost nothing about billing, but I you know often I, I hear from my manager you can only bill for one shot a day and won't they, they bill for the hour. Actually he's recently had So let us an hourly charge as a rapid desensitization it's nine five zero one eight and it pays relatively well. Um, it has nothing to do with the single and one double. of the PIDD diseases, 95018. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That'll be my next one. So it's not a wash, it's actually worthwhile doing if you can assume yeah. the risk and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Art, do you do oh. any, after you get them to whatever maintenance you're aiming for, do you do anything different with them going forward? Um, the same I've been doing with everybody else. On, okay. uh, since 1996, I've been doing two antihistamine non sedating. No, no, it's a singular on, on, yeah. on the morning of allergy yeah. shots. So I've been doing that with them and with okay. everybody else. Okay. So how frequently? I mean, but is it next dose a month later, or what do you do? I, have, I give them the repeat. Uh, get, wonderful question. I give them. I give them the same dose they had, but with just a two double dose antihistamine and double dose singular. One week later, then same thing. Two weeks after that, spreading out like we do when they just reach maintenance. And What's the longest you go between maintenance? I've, I've been my my upbringing is to go four weeks apart, but I know that's people vary with that. So you have them to monthly immunotherapy? How quickly? Within a month? Oh, within two months. So repeat it one week later, then two weeks after that, then three weeks after that, four weeks after that. How are these patients monitored? Or do you have a nurse in there one-on-one -on -one with the patient? They're, they're 
right in my shock room. They have a set, set, we put in this room right next to our shock room in one of our procedure rooms. And and every, before every shot, they do a little portable. Well, I have these ele electronic peak flow meters that will give you an FPV1. We've been using that for FPV1, FPC, and, and uh, oximetry and blood pressure pulse. Do you ever do more than one of these at a time? We've done two, two, two days, two at a time. And my office people, staff. Is, how many people in your office? I have uh, two to three lab techs. Any nurses? RNs. I've met. Uh, I've certified medical technicians. You're there all the time. Oh yeah. This this wouldn't be done without my being there. <laughs> but what, what you're doing here obviously is desensitizing the patient. But in terms of tolerance, do you have any? Do you, do you actually know whether this? Improves, you know, their the speed at which they reach some degree of tolerance, or that their symptoms improve because they're systemically desensitized. That doesn't necessarily mean that their local reactions in the next pollen season or, or something will be different. If you right. looked at or got a gauge of, it's uh, I've had people claim to be improved within two weeks of it, but you know, people do that with regular therapy. Uh, it's been presumed that since you get them up to maintenance, that they get there faster and. And there's been a lot of studies where do, they'll do pre-treatment immunotherapy, pre-seasonal immunotherapy, and it'll work nicely. Uh, so it's been, I, I haven't looked at that. My major goal was to not, not get anybody hurt. Have you had any legal repercussions? No. That's one reason I've been monitoring so closely and, and being so anal about uh, getting informed consent. But uh, I, that doesn't protect you, of course, from legal Oh, yeah. Uh, that's also one reason I've had them tell me they wanted it rather than I. Yeah, I still, still doesn't do that. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks very much. I hate to cut you off. Oh, yeah. oh no, it's uh, perfectly fine. As an anecdote, that half the allergy shot patients could take full dose on the first shot, and the other half you have to build up. And I'm just wondering if there's any way you can sort out the people with your protocol that could do full dose on the first shot. When I tried to accelerate this schedule, I got into trouble a few times. One person was sent to the stomach for half a week after he felt awful about it. Interestingly enough, since I've done double dose, singular double dose antihistamine, my anaphylaxis rate has plummeted. I used to have a mild anaphylaxis from immunotherapy about one every three to four months and made a significant, really significant one every three years. Last 15 years I've had one. Somebody who didn't think pre-treatment was important and he had to be hospitalized. Lisa, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to touch briefly on a couple articles that I reviewed looking at the impact of maternal and infant diet on the development of allergies and asthma in mid-childhood. Uh, I have no disclosures. So the first one is from Jackie. This is looking at peanut milk and wheat intake in pregnancy. And the reason they found or thought their study was kind of a novel study was that it was looking at maternal diet, particularly in the first trimester and beyond, whereas many previous studies that kind of look at maternal diet and its impact on allergies look at things either in the third trimester or um, post-birth on based on a distant recall of what they ate during pregnancy. Um, and they're interested in this because of the theories that intrauterine exposures may play a role in the development of childhood asthma and allergy um, based on the fact that the fetal immune system is developing earlier on in pregnancy um, in the late first trimester, early second trimester. Um, as I mentioned, previous studies have focused more on uh, late pregnancy or, or doing after birth uh, recall of diet and also Previous studies look at uh, populations more so with an allergic propensity at times, whereas the study was um, unselected for HP in the parents. Uh, also, other studies tend to focus more on the first year or so of life in terms of whether atopic dermatitis or other atopic features are present in this study. Um, wanted to look at mid-childhood, so the median age of children um, when they made these conclusions was about seven and a half years old. Um, so this was a prospective pre-birth cohort. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, mothers were seen for uh, questionnaires regarding their food intake during pregnancy in the first trimester as well as the second trimester. Uh, and basically they looked at the calculated servings per day from each of these parents, um, looking at specific allergens, peanut, wheat, milk, egg, and soy. And then they did health assessments on the children at different time points, including six months, a year, and then annually afterwards. Um, until mid-childhood. They assessed for things such as current asthma, allergic rhinitis, and eczema, which they defined uh, based on the International Study of Asthma and Allergic Disease in Childhood survey. 
Um, and that current asthma was defined as uh, doctor diagnosed asthma with either the use of asthma medication or wheezing in the past 12 months and allergic rhinitis uh, was defined as runny nose or sneezing apart from colds in the past 12 months. Eczema was defined as doctor diagnosed eczema as well as presence of itchy rash in the typical places you would expect eczema to be um, that had not gone away for uh, greater than six months. And then ever asthma, allergic rhinitis or eczema was really just based on parent history. They also looked at sensitization to foods, which they defined as anyone with a specific IgE level greater than 0.35, um, as well as food allergy, which they defined as sensitization, plus ever having been prescribed an EpiPen by their doctor for food allergy. Um, this is a table that just kind of goes through the, the characteristics of the people in the cohort. Um, sorry, my mouse here. So, Particularly, they looked at the maternal intake uh, during pregnancy in terms of servings per day of the peanut milk, wheat, egg, and soy, and you can see those kind of mean ranges here. Uh, they make a differentiation between participants um, who they had information on with regards to the endpoint at the uh, child assessment in childhood uh, versus those that had IgE levels. They only were able to get those on about half of the participants. And um, as you can see down here, they have a data with regards to the food sensitization, the food allergy, et cetera. And we'll go over this in more detail. Uh, so what they found in terms of overall prevalence was that food allergy was relatively common in mid-childhood, about 5.6%, which is fairly similar um, to what we've seen in previous studies. Uh, they did find that sensitization to at least one food was higher than that. Again, we do know that some people may have sensitization but not clinically have food allergies. So this is also somewhat in line with what we've seen previously, what they did um, find with regards to maternal peanut intake specifically during the first trimester was that this was associated with a 47% reduced odds of peanut allergic reaction in childhood. They were specifically interested in peanut, so for peanut allergy, they, in addition to having the definition of having to have a specific IgE to peanut and having been prescribed an EpiPen, uh, the people with peanut allergy had to kind of corroborate that they had specific allergic symptoms to peanut, including GI, respiratory, cutaneous, etc. Um, they didn't do that with the other allergens, but they wanted to make sure that the rate they were seeing for food allergy to peanut was um, pretty uh, well defined. They also noticed that with maternal milk intake in the first trimester, this was associated with reduced odds of current asthma, current allergic rhinitis. Um, of note, there were no other foods that were associated with reduced atopic disease in the first trimester aside from peanut and milk intake. And peanut and milk were not associated with any reduced atopic disease if you just looked at intake based on second trimester and beyond. Uh, they did notice that maternal wheat intake in the second trimester seemed to be associated with reduced odds of current atopic dermatitis as well. Uh, and again, these are just kind of reflecting this in a different way. So this is showing the peanut intake in the first trimester. Uh, food allergy is really the only thing that they saw a, a significant reduction um, in the likelihood of having that. And then with regards to milk, they saw reduction in asthma and allergic rhinitis. But as you can see with the other allergens, there were no real significant reductions in atopic disease noted from first trimester intake. And this is second trimester. Um, again, they mentioned that uh, they noted decreased atopic dermatitis with wheat, which you see here, but otherwise really no significant associations in the second trimester. Um, other results they noted was that uh, food allergen sensitization to milk was the most common thing they saw. Peanut sensitization was next most common. Uh, overall prevalence of food allergy to peanut was 4.9%. Again, the 4.6% were uh, the amount of people who specifically reported having clinical symptoms to peanut. So they were trying to say that their definition of defining a food allergy by using a, a specific IgE greater than 3.5 or greater than 0.35, as well as EpiPen prescription, was relatively accurate in terms of identifying people with a food allergy because they were able to corroborate that approximately the same amount of people had um, clinical reaction symptoms as were diagnosed with food allergy by that definition. Um, this is just a result summarizing the amount of children sensitized to one versus multiple food allergens. And this diagram was showing uh, the range in sensitization that was seen. As you can see, um, the one over here on the left, I guess, on your screen, is uh, peanut sensitization, so ranging from 0.35 all the way up to the 400s. The most variety was seen there with regards to sensitization. And some of these others that were noted to be sensitized may not have been clinically relevant, as you can see in this figure down here. Um, those that were actually allergic are shown in red. Those that were sensitized to each of the allergens are in blue. So as you can see, plenty of people showing sensitization in this study that were not actually found to have food allergy, which is um, 
something like that. Is there a correlation between how high your specific IDE is and where you fall out in the blue and the red bars? I mean, they didn't look at that specifically, or at least didn't report on that in the paper, but I would assume. Effective. Yes. One thing I missed here, did, I mean, did they quantify amounts of ingestion? Was this just yes or no, I didn't need it, or I ate this amount? So they, there was supposed to be quantified amounts, and then they kind of went through and calculated a, a sum and divided into servings per day. So the overall amount that was seen was reported as a mean value in servings per day. So people were supposed to report, you know, I ate on average once a week, twice a week, week etc. more peanuts, you had less atopic kids, or? Say that again? The mother ate more peanut, just for example, that was the kid more, less likely to be atopic? Was that a linear thing? So they looked at specific things. So with regards to peanut, they looked at peanut allergy and other atopic diseases. Um, it doesn't specify, you know, with regards to the amount of peanut that was eaten and the amount of ATP present or not. They're just kind of making an overall generalization about um, the mean intake of peanut in the first trimester, second trimester, and then what they saw in terms of outcomes uh, later on. So um, they do note that people who ate higher amounts of peanut with regards to what the mean value was and then above that uh, showed that reduced odds of having peanut allergy specifically. They also look, uh, later on I'll show you another figure, about the likelihood of having other atopic conditions present if the child was in fact peanut allergic, milk allergic, etc. Yes. How did they come up with the idea that 0.36 showed that they were allergic on a RAS score? 0.35? Yeah. They, they said anything greater than 0.35 was sensitization, uh, which, you know, they didn't uh, necessarily say that those children were allergic, but allergic meant that you had either, you had both uh, sensitization as well as had EpiPen prescribed to you, which they admit in their limitations is, is not a perfect diagnosis for food allergy, as EpiPen could have been prescribed for, say, you know, another reason when you have sensitization to milk, it may not be that you're actually food allergic to milk. Um, so that was somewhat of a limitation, but uh, by looking at the peanut allergy in more detail, they tried to say that they thought their food allergy definition was relatively accurate and that they got uh, a very similar number with regards to the, those who were food allergic by the definition of the specific IgE and EpiPen prescription and those who actually had clinical symptoms. Okay, so um, basically, um, in looking at uh, people who had food allergy and the comorbid existence of other atopic disease, they, they noted in mid-childhood those who had peanut, wheat, and soy allergy um, were each associated with having an increased odds of atopic dermatitis, asthma, or allergic rhinitis. Um, milk allergy in mid-childhood was associated with an increased odds of asthma, um, but uh, there was no association seen with egg allergy in mid-childhood and other atopic disease. Uh, and this is shown here with regards to the associations that were noted for peanut, milk, wheat, soy, and egg allergic children in, in regards to other conditions that were present at that time. Uh, and their point based on uh, this was really just to say that it seemed that peanut, wheat, and soy were uh, more associated with other types of allergic disease, making sure that if you have patients that have those uh, allergies in mid-childhood, perhaps you should be screening for other atopic diseases if you hadn't noted those to be present already. Uh, basically, based on what they found in this study, they're trying to say that the maternal diet in early pregnancy seems to have a bigger effect in terms of allergy and asthma outcomes in mid-childhood. Um, they feel that this may be due to um, early encounter with food allergens in the time period when, when patients or when a fetus's immune system is developing, uh, leading to more of a tolerance mechanism rather than sensitization, as it has been shown that maternal dietary antigens can cross the placenta. Um, uh, basically, they wanted to look at this to, to kind of uh, address some of the controversy that's been going on in the past several years with regards to whether or not maternal diets need to be restricted or not. And uh, based on what they found, they feel that there's not a lot of data to support restricting allergenic foods in the maternal diet to prevent ATP. Uh, they did mention there's previous studies that have shown different things, but they feel that um, other studies have not shown um, you know, dietary intake in the first trimester, it's looked at more late pregnancy or based on dietary recall. So they feel that those studies may be less accurate with regards to um, any association seen with peanut intake and uh, atopic disease in childhood. Again, just without under selected, these were not highly atopic families. Right, all so exactly. And previous studies have kind of selected more for ATP when looking at the populations that they, they've been studying. So. 
that previously been a recommendation to uh, pregnant women to actually restrict their diet? In the past, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the question? In, in modern, in the last. Was this a I know it's a nation that also. Yeah, yeah. It, um, I don't. I don't know at what time point uh, it was recommended versus not. But in the past, yes, people have been told. People so the complete yeah. reversal of where food allergy was, basically the whole history of the field of allergy. Right. Well, I know they said that same for kids. No, it was it was recommended in pregnancy as well, or especially with regards to the peanut. So we could stem the peanut epidemic if mothers started eating peanuts the moment they conceived. Right. As long as like. So um, that was one study that I looked at. The other one I was looking at was um, looking at diversity of food choices in regards to complementary foods when you give them to your child. So, you know, there has been um, some controversy about what moms should eat when they're pregnant, and then there's been plenty of controversy about when we should introduce foods to infants and um, how diverse their diet should be with regards to should they be eating certain allergenic foods prior to age one, two, et cetera. Uh, so this study was really looking at the relationship between food diversity in the first year of life and the likelihood of developing asthma and allergies by five years of age. Again, there's been a couple studies looking at food diversity specifically um, in infancy it previously that didn't really show much with regards to um, atopic disease aside from one study showed a, a possible increased um, association with eczema at two years of age, but that association was gone by about five or six years of age with regards to having a more diverse diet. Uh, their theory was that um, postnatal maturation of the immune system is very um, related to the gut microbiome and that um, diversity with regards to foods is exposing children to more environmental antigens at this early part in their life when their immune system is maturing. Uh, so they felt that diverse food choices may uh, help drive the process of tolerance versus sensitization with regards to developing allergic disease down the line. Uh, what they did was look at the child's diet at three months, six months, and 12 months of age. They chose to look at uh, different variables for foods. They split them into 13 different categories. This is based on a Finnish cohort. Um, so some of the foods I think are a little interesting, but basically they looked at cow's milk and formula as one variable. They looked at potatoes as a separate, carrots, turnips, uh, different fruits, uh, wheat, oat, barley, and rice cereals, and then other cereals, meat, fish, egg, cabbage, spinach, lettuce. They didn't look at any nut exposures. Uh, and they defined food diversity as the number of complementary foods that were introduced at three, four, six, and 12 months of age. They again used the International Study of Asthma and Allergy um, in Childhood Questionnaire to determine uh, whether a child's allergic symptoms were sufficient for uh, allergy or asthma at five years of age. Um, what they found was the majority were introduced to mostly just cow's milk between zero and three months of age. Different root vegetables and fruits were the most prevalent thing that was introduced between three and four months of age. And beyond that, um, mostly cereals and meat between four and six, and fish and egg between six and 12 months of age. And this uh, figure just kind of uh, shows that. So you can see in the beginning, it's really just uh, milk, vegetables, and fruits for some. But by the time you get to... Uh, six to 12 months here, pretty much everyone has been introduced to those things. The majority of these other uh, grains, meat, fish, and egg were introduced more at four to six months or greater. This is in the US? This is in Finland. Finland. Mm -hmm. um, what they found was that food diversity in three and four months of age was not associated with any of the endpoints. As you might imagine, most children, at least in the US, haven't really been introduced to many complementary foods at that age. Um, at six months of age, less diversity of foods was associated with an increased risk, risk of allergic rhinitis that they found. And at 12 months of age, less diversity of foods was associated with increased risk of asthma, wheeze, and allergic rhinitis. Um, now they looked at what they called diverse at different age groups varied. So at three months, as I mentioned, most children haven't been exposed to most other complementary foods. So they just looked at no food, one to two or greater than two. But as you get up to 12 months of age, you see that the diverse foods are more based on you know, if you've been exposed to the majority of the foods they listed, they had 13 different variables that they listed for their food categories. So what they showed, um, or what they saw in their adjusted model, and they adjusted for things like child age and gender, um, duration of breastfeeding, history of parental atopy, maternal education, things such as that. Uh, in the adjusted model, they did find that less diverse food choices in 12 months of age was associated with any type of asthma. They did look at both what they called atopic and non-atopic asthma, which they defined as children who had an elevated IgE level in the presence of asthma. Um, so really at 12 months was the only time they found a significant increase in asthma in children who had been exposed to less diverse foods. 
Uh, but at six months of age, they did find allergic rhinitis to be more prevalent in children who had less diverse food choices. Um, this was also the, tr the case at 12 months, as was weeds present at 12 months of age in, in children with less diverse food choices presented to them. So based on their study, they're concluding that uh, less food diversity in the first year of life does appear to increase the risk of childhood allergies and asthma, particularly in the age range beyond 6 to 12 months. Um, again, recommendations in our country by the AAP is exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Um, so introduction of solids can occur anywhere between four to six months. But what they're suggesting is that it might be appropriate to, once you introduce foods, if you are waiting until that time range, to diversify the foods that are introduced uh, more quickly rather than waiting you know, every few days to see if there's a reaction to the new food. If you're, if you're introducing foods prior to six months, they feel that may be more appropriate, but after six months of age, uh, they feel their evidence suggests that diversifying a child's diet may be able to lead to more immune tolerance rather than sensitization than flying. This is something of particular interest to me because I have a child who's starting solids at this point. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you, and any questions? What are you doing as far as diet? Um, I mean, we just started a couple weeks ago. My child's six months now, so um, we're introducing new foods every couple days at this point. And I probably won't restrict any particular food, but so far he's just had fruits and veggies and grains. So. Have they done any studies with kids where they give them, like, Activia or one of these live culture things to give them gut flora that they're changing? Um, not that I know of. Um, I believe they're looking at, I, I know there, there was a study that, that was just published recently looking at pre and probiotics, but I can't remember if that was given to the infants or given to mothers during well, pregnancy. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of the results. But of that. I think it shows they have less atopic yeah. yeah. than well, if you put all these studies together, you need to get some stuff out of a barn and mix it in with the baby's formula, <laughs> and we'll solve this problem. That's right. Well, that was a very good, diverse yeah, morning. Boy. I already forgot the first talk. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop the whole thing. I never well, Lisa, that's a total change. It's 100% reversal. Don't give anybody anything until they're one. Now give them everything you give them to eat. Have they tried limiting just the most common allergies, like let them share things that are blue or maybe blue? Yeah. 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 Yeah.